I'm just going to start talking about uh, neurological examination in the unconscious patient. It's going to be a brief talk and the purpose of the talk really is to act as an appetizer for the main course which is really Andrew Cheng and uh, Anders Arneman who are going to tell us about neuromonitoring. Um, so I'll be fairly brief but just I thought I'd take the opportunity at the beginning just to make some general points about examining the, the unconscious patient and we'll just deal with a, a handful of issues that I think may be pertinent. Most of you come from hospitals around New South Wales, mainly around the Sydney area including Wollongong and, uh, and the John Hunter Hospital and most of you work in critical care and you'll have your own approach to examining the unconscious patient. I thought I would just focus on one or two key issues that kind of occur to me. Generally every ward round that I do when we're examining patients um, and just share them with you as, as thoughts that, that may be helpful. <coughs> so the context is really when you're first faced with an unconscious patient and you're uncertain of the cause, how do you work out uh, what the cause is and therefore what you're going to do about it. Um, I found this, this is quite useful, I don't know if you, 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 you use such a system, but there is the neurological ABC and this involves the usual things that we would do, looking at the neck first and then dealing with the airway breathing and circulation, but the D, E, F and G I think are just all worth just thinking about and remembering. So D for diabetes, uh, diabetic coma, causes of coma, drugs, the effects of drugs as a cause of unconsciousness, epilepsy, whether it be non-convulsive or in the post-ictal state, um, fever as a cause of unconsciousness because of meningism, meningitis and encephalitis, and then of course performing the Glasgow Coma Scale at that point in time. Herniation is important to consider when you're first meeting an unconscious patient and I think there are characteristic signs that are worth uh, just discussing um, that you should look for on your first appraisal of this type of patient. So <clears throat> here's an example of a, a normal brain and a brain that's under pressure because of a mass lesion and there are two types of herniation syndrome that are really important to pick up early that of the temporal lobe herniating and also that of just general downward pressure um, on, on the brain stem and both of these these, these issues affect the retic reticular activating system and cause unconsciousness because of the effects on those. So temporal lobe herniation is quite a rapidly progressive thing and first of all presents with ipsilateral pupillary abnormalities and ipsilateral um, hemiplegia but will rapidly progress to tetraparesis and bilaterally dilated pupils and death if not dealt with and that's normally from a mass lesion in the supratentorium but also a slower kind of progressive injury maybe from a slower growing tumour or a more slower growing um, hemorrhage, if you like, could be just global increase in supratentorial pressure, <laughs> compressing the upper part of the brainstem and inhibiting the reticular activating system. And it's important to have this in mind when you first assess a patient. In terms of trying to formulate uh, a, a diagnosis as to where the problem lies, I think it's useful to think of it in terms of three main components. We're trying to isolate the lesion either to one that's predominantly supratentorial or one that's infratentorial, so affecting the brainstem or cerebellum and then a diffuse encephalopathy that's actually affecting all of the brain and affecting the reticular activating system in that way. And that can be with and without meningism. We'll go into a bit more detail about causes towards the end of this brief talk. And all of these, like I said, the predominant mechanism is inhibition of the reticular activating system. There's three main things that I want to do, well actually four just in the presentation. Um, 
I wanted to just make the point, and I'll go through each of these in turn, that the history is vital in terms of when you first assess a patient who's unconscious, and it provides very valuable clues as to what the etiology is. And if you ignore the history, you're likely to arrive at the wrong conclusion, and it's a really important part of the clinical examination. Talk a little bit about that. The other point I wanted to make is about the unconscious patient being present, and become clearer why I'm saying that when we get to the slides on that. And then the third one I wanted to talk about is the graded assessment that we do in a critically ill patient. And I just want to make a point about elevating our kind of interpretation of what the eyes can do uh, before we do a painful stimulus. And I'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so in terms of the history, I think the most vital things for me whenever I see a patient, really the top thing there, is the onset of the pathology. This is completely vital in terms of isolating what the type of pathology is. And if you have a sudden onset, it's likely to be vascular. If you have something that's subacute, um, kind of over a few days, that's more likely perhaps to be infective, like an encephalitis or a slowly growing abscess. Um, or if there's something that's taking an even longer time course, then it's likely to be something that's going progressing more gradually. And an example of this might be hypercapnic respiratory failure that is progressive over time and you'll get a history if you take it of first perhaps some kind of drowsiness, then some loss of mobility and then coma occurring. But the, 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 the process will take place over several weeks rather than days or instantaneously. So the onset of the, the, onset of the problem is key. Progression over time we've talked about a little bit. It's always important to quantify what the neurological process is doing in terms of functional ability to the patient. So how's the patient changed from what they were like before the problem happened to what they're like now? And I think the collateral history is absolutely vital too. And this isn't a description of what the doctors who've reviewed the patients thought and how they investigated the patient. This is actually taking collateral history from the relatives to understand what they noticed and then translating that into there's a problem with speech, there's a problem with gait, and then trying to localise the lesion based on that kind of decoding of what the relatives say to you. Okay, the patient. <clears throat> so the unconscious patient is present. Now, I don't know if you recognise ward rounds where people are looking at screens rather than the patient. It happens to me frequently. We have screens, many screens in the unit, and I'll often find myself thinking when we do a ward round that there's one person with the patient and everyone else is crowded around the screens outside the rooms. And I think we're losing focus of what's important here. The patient is clearly present. And look, just if we think about it, there is more and more data emerging, more and more literature em emerging, that patients find intensive care a very traumatic experience. And when they remember it after they've recovered, there are terrible dreams, nightmares that they have. And it's almost like a, it's termed a post-traumatic stress disorder. I, I wonder whether part of that is us and the way that we behave around the bedside. If we behave as if the patient is conscious, even though they're unconscious, and we speak to them as though they're a person when we're examining them and we're talking about them, maybe we can make a difference to how they perceive intensive care later on. I'm not sure how conscious and aware they are when we're examining them, and they may, be, they may seem very deeply unconscious, but if we treat them as a person, I wonder whether we can make a difference to how they perceive intensive care later down the line. And I think that's just a general point I want to make. And if you remember what people are like, I think photos are very useful. Um, but if you imagine if it was you in that bed and you could actually hear what was being said around the bedside, how you would feel. So I'd just ask you to carry that thought with you the next time you're doing a ward round in someone who is seemingly unconscious and just think about how we're behaving around the bedside. Okay. Now the next point I wanted to make just about this is that what we do when we assess someone neurologically is we do a graded assessment of response to incremental stimuli. 
So I'm just going to take you to an example of a patient that I met when I was an advanced trainee at Prince of Wales Hospital when I was studying to do the intensive care finals exam. And I was asked to assess a young male who looked very fit but was unconscious and to work out why this man was unconscious. So what I did was I observed, I looked, there was no movement. I look often for you know, the head falling to one side or flexion of an arm to suggest a hemiplegia or asymmetrical movements, maybe extra movements like seizures or myoclonus that might be useful. You can get all that information before you touch the patient. The other thing I find really helpful is, is spontaneous movements by the patient. Are they moving in a normal motor pattern or is there a focal weakness or are there decerebrate or decorticate, suggesting that there's pathology there? So I did all of that. There was nothing. This patient wasn't moving. They looked deeply unconscious. They'd received no sedation and no paralysis recently. The next thing I did was a verbal stimulus, and this is probably familiar to all of you. You kind of talk to the patient, you raise your voice, and then you begin to shake them gently, shake them a bit harder, so you're increasing the intensity of the stimulus. And at this point, I can't remember what I did, whether I looked at the eyes or not, just to do the pupils. But then I thought, OK, I'll do a painful stimulus to see what this person could do. And I did this centrally and peripherally, got nothing. There was no movement of this patient. I then went through the cranial nerves, the pupils were reactive, the corneal reflex didn't really look to be present, and the gag was absent bilaterally. And then I got to the tone and the motor system, and it was flaccid quadriparesis. So I wasn't sure what was going on. It seemed like there was a problem in the brainstem. It wasn't working. And this young man was deeply unconscious. I was then told that the CT scan was completely normal. And, um, and then the person who was taking me for the case, they'd observed me do a central painful stimulus and then a painful stimulus to each nail bed on each limb. And I found out that the reason with the patient, actually, I'm not going to tell you. What's the thing that I forgot to do? Can anyone tell me what's the thing that I forgot to do out of what I described? Don't be shy. <laughs> Just anyone? Surely someone. Paul, you're really clever. What, <laughs> what did I forget to do? Not sure. How did you do this? Yeah, really, pretty savagely, do you know? It was, it was firm <laughs> pressure for five seconds, yeah. Nicholas. <coughs> no? So... Was it linking with his eyes? Okay, so we're getting closer here. It's all about the eyes. Yeah, go on. Yeah, okay. So I didn't look for that. I was just interested in the pupils. And there's the answer to you, okay? So it's all about the eyes. And I think what you should do before you go from a mild physical stimulus to a painful stimulus, the first time you see someone, you should open the eyes, ask them to look up or down, to the left and the right, and observe for tracking. Because you will miss what this guy had was profound Guillain-Barre. He was unable, he was completely aware, but unable to move anything, even his facial muscles. And that was his problem. I, I never have forgotten that case. And I've always felt that we must do the eyes. And I try and teach this when I'm doing ward rounds. But I think it is really important, particularly the first time you see a patient. The other type of patient you will miss is, of course, the one who's locked in. Um, someone who has a high brainstem lesion, who is able to actually blink, or perhaps has vertical gaze preserved. And unless you do that, you will miss it. I'm hoping next year that patient, because those of you who work at Prince of Wales will know him, he often comes back and talks to staffs about his experience. I'm hoping he'll come to this symposium and we'll be able to invite him to talk about what he experienced while he was unconscious. Um, but also the locked-in syndrome I think is really important because I've met patients who have been told they have terrible stroke, brainstem, forget about them, you know, just palliate. And then actually when you talk to them, you realise that they're aware and they can cooperate and they can communicate. They can spend valuable time with their families. I mean, the, the policeman that I, I remember who had the locked-in syndrome lived for three or four weeks 
participated in the discussion not to tracheostomize him and had a fantastic time with his family even though he was locked in. He could communicate and they could communicate at a high level with him before he died. And the neurologist involved and myself benefited. We got a bottle of champagne at Christmas from this, from the family, because we were the ones that recognised this was happening. So if you, the first time you see someone who's unconscious and you're, you're, you're evaluating them, please look at the eyes before you do the painful stimulus. Okay, now I'm gonna, the rest of the talk's fairly brief. I think I've made the main points I really wanted to do. You can examine most cranial nerves. I think you know that. The first and the eleventh are probably the hardest ones, but you can examine every cranial nerve, and it's important to do so to localise the lesion, okay? If there's a brainstem lesion, this is information that is important. You can also do a lot with the peripheral nervous system, tone, power, reflexes, observation we've already talked about. You can gain a great deal of information that allows you to localise where the lesion is and then you can think about imaging etc to try and refine the cause and maybe lumbar puncture too. Okay, so broad categories, we fall into three broad cat categories, supratentorial pathology, infratentorial pathology and then diffuse pathology. Um, supratentorial pathology is fairly straightforward, hemorrhage, it, it, actually it's the same list really but just different causes for supratentorial, infratentorial pathologies but just different areas affected and if someone there's nothing focal and you think it's a diffuse encephalopathy then the main discriminatory thing is whether there's meningism or not. If there's meningism, you need to think about subarachnoid hemorrhage and meningitis. If there's not, you can think about these other causes that I've listed that I'm sure you're aware of. Okay, so just summing up, that's really all I wanted to say. I wanted to make sure that we got the message that the history is vital, the unconscious patient is present, and don't forget about the eyes before you do a painful stimulus. Um, and just some of the limitations, because this now introduces Andrew and Anders. We are limited in the truly unconscious patient about the information that we have. We should talk to them as though they're there, but we need more information than the vital signs and possibly an ICP. We need information about how the brain is being perfused and how it's performing biologically. And that area is going to be further developed by Andrew and Anders. So with that, I'd just like to close.